Welcome to Beneath the Bible, where we're helping you dig deeper and uncover the world beneath the sacred book. Last week we talked about myth and its relationship with the Bible, specifically something called the sea myth. Today we're going to move from the abstract and get a little more concrete by looking at a specific myth, one called the Baal Cycle. We'll look at what's in this ancient Near Eastern story, then we'll explore a couple ways to understand the Baal Cycle, especially in light of the sea myth, and how, if at all, it relates to the Bible. The sea myth is a kind of meta-theme, or a common trend, in some ancient Near Eastern myths. It's a mythic pattern which starts with a state of pre-order or disorder, proceeds through conflict or combat, and results in the world being set in a proper order. Now, this conflict or combat usually pits a storm god against a sea or water god, thus the name sea myth. The proper ordering of the world is understood as the creation of the world in some form or another, and the ordering god is made king over the gods and given a temple as a palace from which to rule. The sea myth is seen in several places, notably in written form, but also in artistic representations of it. Now, it's not clear where the sea myth originated, and there's no scholarly consensus about its origins, but it's clear that the sea myth is incredibly old. Now, there are different iterations of it, which scholars generally group into East Semitic traditions and West Semitic traditions. Now, while there are these two general traditions, the development of the sea myth is, as one scholar has put it, less like a tree branch and more like a spider web. So the East Semitic tradition is perhaps best represented in the Enuma Elish that we talked about last week, while the West Semitic sea myth is probably best preserved and presented in the Ugaritic Baal cycle. Now, there's no doubt that the East Semitic tradition influenced the biblical writers, especially while the Judahites were in exile in Babylon. But the West Semitic tradition is argued, and I think quite rightly, to have had a more profound influence on the biblical tradition. The Baal Cycle is a series of three distinct but related stories about the god Baal that were partially preserved on six tablets that were archaeologically recovered from the city of Ugarit. We have a video about Ugarit if you want to learn more about what this site is and how it relates to the Canaanites in the biblical world. In short, I'll just say that we take the perspective that while the Ugaritic tablets closely resemble the Canaanite mythic world, Ugaritic culture is distinct from Canaanite culture. The material from Ugarit is incredibly important for understanding the Canaanites as well as the Israelite worldviews, but we need to keep in mind that it shouldn't be taken as an exact match for either one. The Baal Cycle's three integrated stories can be read on their own, but you really need to read all three together to understand their significance. They are preserved in six tablets referred to as KTU 1.1 through 1.6. You can find translations of these for free on the internet, but for a number of reasons, even in translation, it can be hard to follow the storyline, so we'll give an overview of what's in them here. The first story begins with Baal as king of the gods. The god El, the patriarch, creator, and chief god of the Ugaritic pantheon, encourages his own son Yam, the god of the sea, to challenge Baal for the kingship. Yam claims the title of king when his messengers rudely go before the divine council and demand they recognize Yam as king. This act is also in defiance of established court order and protocols. El agrees to the messengers' demands and makes Yam king and Baal his slave. In response, Baal prepares for battle even having this special magical weapon fashioned for him. The two would-be kings fight, each drawing on a group of allies, and ultimately Baal strikes down Yam and emerges victorious. The second story in Tablets 1.3 and 1.4 conveys how Baal builds a palace. Killing a rival and declaring yourself king does not a king make. A king in the ancient Near East needed a palace from which to rule, and in the case of a god, this palace was a temple. Think of the palace as a symbol of his kingship. A real and legitimate king has a palace. Now, believe it or not, building narratives were common enough in the ancient world that we have a set format, one which this narrative mostly follows. First, Baal seeks permission from El to build himself a temple. He sends emissaries to other gods to ask that they champion his position, and first he goes to Anat, a goddess of war, but El denies her request after she is pretty rude. Then Anat and Baal go to Atharat, the consort of El. She respectfully asks El to relent, which he ultimately does, and Baal is permitted to build his temple. Remember that having a palace was necessary to legitimize Baal's kingship, so El permitting Baal to build a palace is an admission that Baal is the true, legitimate king. Baal bends over backwards to respect El and the protocols of the Divine Council, in contrast to Yom from the first story and Anat, who both behave rude. 
But all is showing he will not be a tyrant, but will bring order as king. So back to the story, Baal builds his temple and there's an interesting debate on whether or not to have windows in his palace. And Baal initially does not want windows, but later relents. The text on the tablet is partially missing at this point, but it seems that Baal is still concerned Yom may sneak into his house and harm his daughters. However, Baal realizes that it is through these windows that he, the storm god, will send rain, so he needs the window. The final story deals with Baal's conflict with Mot, the god of death. Early in their conflict, Maul is initially victorious and he sends Baal to the underworld. And when he does this, the earth begins to suffer. And with ba without Baal sending the rains, the fields dry up. And El has a dream of the land being restored, which he takes as a confirmation of Baal's legitimacy as king. And meanwhile, Baal leaves the underworld and again fights Maul. While these two evenly matched opponents struggle, Mo is informed by a messenger that El affirms Baal as the rightful king and that El will be against Mo if he keeps fighting. Mo wisely relents and recognizes Baal as the rightful king. The text breaks off at this point, so it's not clear how the story ends, but presumably ends with Baal being re-enthroned and sending rain to the suffering land. This story is significant because it shows that while El was the creator god, he was not capable of sustaining creation. Without Baal's reign, the creation was withering. El was responsible for what can be called creatio prima, or the initial creation, while Baal was responsible for creatio continua, or sustaining creation. We might usually think of creation only in terms of creatio prima, but this misses an important way of understanding the creative act. Without Baal sustaining reigns, creation can't continue. And without Baal returning to his palace as king, creation would fall back into its previous state of disorder. Now, I'll admit, we retold the story with a particular interpretive slant, but we want to recognize that there are multiple ways of reading this myth, and they aren't all mutually exclusive. One of the earliest readings was that of a seasonal myth. In this reading, the Baal cycle is a mythical telling of the end of the summer drought. Around September in the Near East, the rains return and the rivers and valleys fill with water again. These rivers, fed by the rain, float into the sea and do, in a sense, do battle with it. This reading is perhaps strongest in light of the final story where Baal goes to the underworld and the rain stops. Then when he returns, the rains come back. In this seasonal myth, Baal is a fertility god whose rain brings life to the land after its seasonal drought. And essentially, the natural phenomenon is mythicized. While this is a popular interpretation, it does have some flaws, and it isn't held by a lot of scholars who study the Baal cycle. Instead, most scholars hold to either the cosmogenic or political interpretations. The political interpretations see Baal as a sort of stand-in for the city of Ugarit itself. Baal was the primary god and protector of the city, so this makes some sense. And the city was initially weak, but grew in strength, and it was caught between Egypt and the Hittites. The Baal cycle then is a mythicization of the city and particularly its elite, specifically the monarchy. The focus on the kingship of Baal and the fact that throughout the myth it reflects the customs of the royal court at Udigrek gives, gives support to this interpretation. The focus on kingship is significant because what it is saying about Baal's kingship and what makes a good king is prescriptive for the king of Ugarit. Good kings bring order. Illegitimate kings cannot bring order. Legitimate kingship is marked by various metrics that kings need to demonstrate. The political interpretation is championed and articulated most clearly by Mark S. Smith, if you want to read more about it. This view works really well and has a lot going for it. It's nice because it doesn't exclude other interpretations of the myth. After all, myths are polyvalent. They have layers of meaning and multiple meanings. It makes perfect sense that this myth had a political function, but this doesn't preclude other ways that the people of Ugaric may have understood it. The best example of another prominent understanding of the Baal cycle is the cosmogenic interpretation. This view sees the Baal cycle as dealing with cosmic concerns, specifically creation through conflict with chaotic forces. If you've watched this far, you'll know this is an interpretation I'm sympathetic to. This interpretive framework has strong, was strongly championed by the noted Hebraicist and biblical scholar Frank Moore Cross. Numerous other scholars have fleshed out this interpretation, and you can see how the Baal cycle follows the Semith paradigm. In broad strokes, it moves from pre-order through conflict and ends with a properly ordered world. There is conflict with the sea god Yam where Baal is victorious and he's rewarded with kingship. This kingship is legitimized and recognized with a palace. And during his conflict with Mot, the chief god El recognizes Baal's kingship and the need for Baal to sustain creation, recognizing Baal as a kind of creator in his role as creatio continua. Now, the cosmogenic interpretation has its critics. Some argue that the combat elements are the core of the myth, as victory and combat are requirements of good ancient Near Eastern kings. This argument sees the creative element as a later addition that shouldn't factor into the interpretation of the story. Perhaps a better critique is the idea that chaos, which is a pretty important element in many cosmogenic readings, 
is a Greek idea rather than an ancient Near Eastern one. And chaos as a concept supposedly postdates the myth, so how can any understanding of chaos be an intended element in the myth? While it's true that chaos is a Greek word and most modern readers understand chaos by its inherited Greek associations, this doesn't mean the concept would have been entirely foreign at ancient Ugarit. This distinction is why scholars have started to shift toward the language of disorder or preorder instead of chaos. Because the Greek terms cosmos and chaos have been used rather haphazardly and anachronistically, the vocabulary is rightly shifting from chaos and order to things like preorder and order. Yom may not be properly called a chaos monster, but he certainly represents a disordered world and opposes a good and orderly world. He would be a bad king because he would not bring about an ordered world for anyone. We'd like to make a few general observations on why the Baal cycle is relevant for biblical scholarship. Now first, this myth is incredibly important for understanding the god Baal and how he was perceived. Now obviously, Baal shows up a lot in the Bible. In the Bible, Baal is seen as the chief rival of Yahweh, or at least Baal worship is seen as opposed to the worship of Yahweh. Now, in light of the Baal cycle, this rivalry makes sense. Baal is responsible for bringing rain and fertility to the land. He is the sovereign of all the gods. Baal is a good, ordering god. Now, these are all qualities that the Bible says are properly attributed to Yahweh. And in the Canaanite worldview, Baal fulfilled many of the same functions as Yahweh did in the Israelite worldview. So worship of Baal by Israelites was particularly problematic. What's also interesting is that even though Baal and Yahweh were seen as rivals, we also see a lot of appropriation of Baal imagery for Yahweh by biblical authors. In the Baal cycle, we're told that Baal, what Baal does and what his epithets are. We see him in the Canaanite divine council, among other divine beings. And then in the, in the Bible, we see some of these same things applied to Yahweh. For example, in Psalm 82, we see Yahweh before a divine council. In the Baal cycle, Baal is called the rider on the clouds, which is a description we see applied to Yahweh in Isaiah. It's been argued that Psalm 29 was originally a hymn to Baal, and that was reappropriated to Yahweh because the imagery so closely matches. You could substitute Baal for Yahweh in Psalm 29, and it would make complete sense as a Canaanite hymn. If you want to see why, we have a whole video on Psalm 29 that you can check out here. Another theme in the Baal cycle is rightful kingship. What makes a good king and what makes a bad king? And what makes a good divine king is what makes a good human king. Divine kingship is the precedent and the model for human kings to emulate. We'll look at this idea a bit more next week. But in this series, we're looking at myth and how we see elements of the sea myth throughout the Bible. Now, because the sea myth is present, but often with significant alterations, the Canaanite or Ugaritic traditions of it, like the Baal cycle, are especially important for understanding how the sea myth is used in the Bible. Now, we don't have time to go through all the places that we see echoes of the sea myth in the Bible. It's in many of the Psalms, it's throughout Job, and the prophets draw on the imagery of the sea myth for rhetorical effect. Genesis 1 and 2 are best understood when contextualized through the lens of the sea myth. We even see echoes of the sea myth when Jesus calms the sea in the Gospels, although in this case it's filtered through the sea myth imagery in Genesis. Be sure you're subscribed because next week we're going to look at the Israelites' vocabulary around these ideas and some biblical passages where we see this in more detail. Finally, let's look at one important contribution of the Israelites to the sea myth. It's called the historicization and eschatologization of the sea myth. So what does that mean? Well, the Israelites interpreted their own history and projections of their future through the lens of this myth. For example, they took real historical events and real historical people and places and mapped those onto the paradigm of the sea myth. Now, this is clear in Exodus 15, where the events of the Exodus are told in light of the sea myth. In Psalm 89, it's not clear if the psalmist is talking about the exodus or creation at times because of this overlap in imagery. And that's kind of the point. The history and the myth are woven together. We see this elsewhere in the prophets, especially where Israel's enemies, particularly Egypt, are equated with sea monsters. It's pretty clear here in Isaiah 30, verse 7, Psalm 87, Isaiah 51, and Ezekiel 29. The idea here is that Israel used the sea myth as a way of understanding their own history and their own world. 
So if we don't understand the sea myth too, we're missing out on an important layer of the way Israel told its own story. Thanks for joining us for this Beneath the Bible video. Be sure to give this video a like and subscribe to our channel so you don't miss any future videos. If you learned something new today, take a minute to share this video with your friends. And until next time, keep digging.